morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being on time. You have on the screen the point of today's lecture. We are done with Evernote. It's such a user-friendly app that there isn't enough that needs to be really demonstrated in class. You'll see that the next app, DocuWiki, is more of an old-fashioned software which requires a little bit of coding and certainly looks more hermetic, more difficult, more cryptic than it is because it is not that difficult. It's just that it makes full use of Markdown and pages look, when you're working on them, look like they're full of code. The code is in fact quite simple. So, in lieu of continuing with our demonstrations and hands-on activities with Evernote, I will catch up with my introduction of the focal points in the reading. And keep in mind that this presentation notes about the introduction and printing in its context was expanded from Monday into Wednesday. So keep, keep that in mind in case you've printed the first version. So number two is canceled. Number three is something I would like very much to uh, have with you a discussion on your reactions to Evernote and your idea of how Evernote and Notion compare. Finally, I would like today, but there will be other occasions, to start introducing the main points in the creation of the digital project and the expectations involved in that assignment, which is also linked then to an oral presentation. So it represents a big chunk of your final grade, okay? Keep in mind that you have an assignment on Evernote due next week. You're supposed to send me for approval a link to a YouTube video on Evernote that you will be uh, summarizing, analyzing, working on for that assignment, I confirmed, I responded to all emails that came to me up to yesterday evening. In the morning, I have a class at 9.15, so in the morning of uh, any Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I don't have time to look at my email. So if you sent your, submitted your video late last night or early this morning, wait for the afternoon when I'll be back in my office and I'll be responding to you saying, yes, it's confirmed. But keep in mind, you have a page. And from that page, you see what has been chosen, selected by others already. So we were talking about the printing industry and how quickly it developed. And we said, this is the first industrial revolution in some ways, because it produces a serialized pro product. It produces a product that is uh, uh, placed into the market in prodigious numbers. And we're not talking about small things such as a nail. We're talking about books, right? So there is a whole process involved, and yet, Within 50 to 60 years, you find tens of millions of books being produced with some locales such as Venice or Paris being really the centers of this industry throughout Europe. And to a degree, this is still true. For example, if you take books, uh, photographic books, comic books, uh, most of the printing is still done in Italy for all of the European countries. Up until the 1990s, every Disney publication sold in Europe was being printed in Italy. Okay, so this tradition has survived. The expertise has remained linked to the territory to a certain degree. Besides being the first industry and creating a new form of capitalism, you can understand what the indirect consequences would be of this expansion. If you're producing millions of books, then you need readers to expand, 
right? So literacy all of a sudden acquires more than a social flavor. There is some economic interest connected to expanding the base of readers. As you find in the book, it's hard to calculate population in Europe during a time such as this. The book says 100 million people in Europe at that time. I would say the margin of error would be 25 million to be generous. So it could be as few as 75 million, as, ma as many as 125 million. To be generous, you, you could very well say the margin of error is 50 million. Regardless, during a period such as this, you may find about 2%, 2 to 5% to be generous of people who are really able to read and understand, who are educated enough to read and understand practically any text. And you find another 5% for a total of 10% who have had some exposure to reading, who have some degree of literacy. They can read some texts. They can understand them, uh, maybe not, uh, completely, and you see that you have an industry with tens of millions of products, which are kind of expensive, so hence you have the need to expand the base. Not only among the readers, but take people working in a printing press. Now, you need manual laborers, because essentially when you have a printing press, you have to place the uh, uh, letters next to each other to create the matrix, then you put the matrix down, you put the paper on top, and you turn a screw to press after you apply the ink, of course, on blocks, then you repeat again, over and over again, but you need to have, within the printing press, workers that are able to read somewhat. And in fact, one of the typical aspects of the procedure of printing a book page after page, or depending on the size of the book, if it is a quarto, if it is an octavo, you have multiple pages being printed first, impressed, and then they're being cut. What you do is you look at your product while you're working on it. And the moment you spot a mistake, a typo, right? You have it corrected on the matrix, which is why, as I said, it is true that it's basically the first serial product, the book produced by the printing press, but especially during this period, even now, but especially during this period, when you have 300, 500 books, you find small differences in between one and the other. And in fact, even when we have only three, five surviving copies of a book from this period, chances are that if you have at least five books, you'll find some small differences from one page to another. And then you have all kinds of secondary commercial activities. Not only you have, of course, you have books, you have bookstores, right? That, that's a given. But then you have traveling booksellers. You have people who fill a basket with books, put it on their shoulders, and walk to the next town, and walk from town to town, selling books, especially short, small format books. Books that would be popular kind of literature, or even religious books, because religion is popular. Religion sells among a larger base of people, especially in the countryside. And besides the serious books, since it is a commercial product now, you have pamphlets. A pamphlet is something written by a mid-level, or sometimes even an upper-level intellectual, who quickly puts together some scandalous content, scandalous in terms of the politics of the time, or in reference to people in society who are kind of the celebrities of the time, or a series of those things, or, of course, erotic books, pornographic books, pornography really uh, uh, is, is revived by the industry, not that pornography did not exist before the printing press. And then, these books are exactly made to sell and to make money. Okay. Gazettes are the first format of what today's are newspapers and journals. But oftentimes these gazettes are just 
one piece of paper, one page, folded so that you have four faces with some illustration, especially on the first, so that you can show it and attract the attention of people. What do you find in these gazettes sold in Venice, for example, uh, wh which is where the, the, the modern press in some ways is born? These gazettes will have notices about freaks or monsters, deformed babies, which are considered to be prodigious, supernatural entities that uh, would announce the end of times or some other change that uh, God wants to communicate to us. Or uh, news about wars, about battles, about murders. So it's the lowest kind of journalism, the news that would sell these pages most quickly. And a lot, of course, are printed daily or on a need to, right? Whenever there is something that will sell. Uh, and, and, and they're consumed quickly, and most of these, the copies of these gazettes, especially from the early 1500s, have disappeared. I saw once in Venice, I saw one once in Venice at the Marciana Library. I was there to study this Venetian humanist, Marin Sanudo, and I, I was consulting his, the manuscripts of his chronicles. And inside, he had placed one of these gazettes showing a baby born with one leg and is represented with this leg being like a bird's leg, like a turkey leg. And then this body uh, that is also deformed place there on the front page to sell, right? Read about this one-eyed, one-leg monster that was born in Germany and what it means, right? The magic comes with it, etc. Then, of course, it's not only print, printed text. You can print just illustration, the best example of something that sells, that is, that caters even to people who cannot read, are the images sacred images, especially images of saint, which people keep as an amulet, not just to pray to a saint, but for protection. And again, uh, it's hard to find a lot of these small images. They can be as small as this, uh, a couple of inches, have disappeared, right? Because time and, and the quality of the paper has, has destroyed them. I have one that I found in a book from the 18th century, which I, I put in a small portrait, and it was, uh, it's, it's an image of Saint Peter, okay? And again, these images of Saint are sold by traveling sellers who take uh, hundreds or thousands of these images and then walk from town to town until they've sold, sold everything and then they go back home. And sometimes they can travel a lot. From Italy, they can reach Eastern Europe or even uh, Eastern Russia or what would they be, Belarus and Ukraine, okay? So take Francis Bacon, we saw his name about a modern education. What does it say about his times? We are in between the 16th and the 17th century. There are three things that have changed the world completely. Gunpowder, the compass, and the printing press. Okay, so this is considered a, a, a society-changing, world-changing technology. Yet, as much as it is considered a modern thing, it doesn't mean that there isn't a transition where the old and the new interface and overlap. So you see phenomena that are kind of weird that you wouldn't expect necessarily, but for example, you see that a lot of books are printed but then they're given to an artisan who will take a pen and ink and color the drop cuts at the beginning of each chapter. Color and illustrate the margins of the book in pen. So you have these hybrid products that are printed, the text, and then the illustrations and the colors added page by page, painstakingly with ink. And of course, they're the most beautiful books. And you still see it. For example, you may find, if you go to Google Books, it happens all the time, that you find an old book printed and the drop cap is missing. The big letter at the beginning of the first paragraph, you find a white space 
and a small letter, maybe a small T, which is just a signal for the artist that this is where you have to paint a T with, with ink, right? But no one did it because the way it works is that the buyer is supposed to get the book and then the buyer brings it to a shop with a scribe, with an illustrator and pays extra for that. Now, if this hybrid form is already kind of bizarre, think of the readers, and we know that from documents, private documents of the time, think of old fashioned readers who would say, pretty much the same way that some people will say today, I cannot read from a tablet, I have to have a book in front of me. The same way, old fashioned readers would purchase a book, bring it to a scribe shop and say, can you copy this onto a manuscript? Because they would refuse to read the printed copy. They were used to manuscripts. They would only read manuscripts. And orality doesn't disappear. The oral channels of communication don't disappear simply because there are printed books. So orality is still a big thing in the church, right? People go to church to listen to homilies, to listen to religious lectures. In academia, same things. The students listen to the professors. They don't really have textbooks. They might have shops that produce copies of the notes taken by other generations of students, but it's still pretty much through oral communication. And how does the news travel, information travel in a large metropolitan area? Orally, right? By people listening to stories and telling each other stories. So orality still encompasses a big chunk of communication during this time. Certainly millions of books means a, an explosion of information, right? All of a sudden, and you, you see this with the digital revolution, the print is a similar revolution. All of a sudden, information that was accessible and accessed only by a few intellectuals, so less than half percent of the whole population, less than half percent, to be generous, is now available to 20, 30 times as many people. Not a hundred percent, clearly, right? But a uh, manifold uh, expansion. And if you have this information, then you understand why books are not just printed, but they're formatted in a certain way, right? And the format of the book, the way you package information, is exactly to make that information more accessible. So before that time, you don't find necessarily in a book a table of content, divisions in, sub in chapters, in uh, sections, etc., or the frequency with which illustrations are found. As a consequence, because the format of the book becomes essential to the sale of the product, then you also have other ancillary consequences, the standardization of languages, right? Because you need to reach uh, uh, readers with a homogenized kind of product. And therefore, it is during this period that the spelling of words gets confirmed and becomes fixed, including names and surnames. And you have the written alphabet per in each language become standard as well as punctuation. There are some things that didn't exist before, the parentheses, etc., uh, etc., et that because oftentimes manuscripts did not include punctuation. They might have included periods, sometimes not even that. Because you have so many books, then you need something entirely new. You need to also print catalogs of books with information about those books, not to mention book reviews, right? And because you have so much information floating, then you have the beginning of encyclopedias, right? Because the consumer, is overwhelmed by information, then I'm offering you one product or a small series of uh, volumes with all the information nicely organized and structured. Dictionaries come out during this period, as well as grammars. And then a lot of attention to the visual information. So a lot of books with maps or single maps being printed and 
uh, sold as well as entire travel guides including both maps and text as well as illustration which changes the way you travel i call it mind traveling simply because that's what happens between the 1500s and the 1800s that people would travel with a book of course we're talking about those who are rich enough to travel as a form of entertainment or to get an education about the world we're not talking about necessarily the merchants and it's not the majority of the population but mind traveling means that you travel with a book about the place you visit you go to italy and you read roman history or you go to italy and if you're religious you read about the saints about the, the history of the church and it becomes mind traveling because what you read superimposes overlaps with your physical experience of the territory so you're in a street you're in a piazza and what is that you find in a travel when those travelers document their experience they find themselves in a place and instead of just getting in drinking in the experience of the landscape the place the people they're thinking about what happened in this place the historical events the social events that would happen in the past what they've read, their information, their idea, becomes the augmented reality of traveling during that time. Only it's not the same as wearing the metaverse glasses or Google glasses or the new Apple contacts that will allow you to see virtual reality and nothing else. So natural reality will be hidden to you. Marshall McLuhan and his disciple Walter Ong talk a lot on the cultural and psychological consequences of print and the book gives you a lot of details including titles etc keep in mind that you have these because you'll be tested in the exam on the concepts not on what McLuhan what Ong said not on that level of details but those names need to be mentioned because they are the founders of this discipline they talk a lot about the shift from auditory to visual brought by the printing revolution, meaning that before the printing press, most people will read loud to themselves. Even when they were not reading, they would articulate, they would move their vocal cords, which is something that some people still do, rather than using exclusively their eye. And this shift to visual in their mind is confirmed by the prevalence of diagrams that you wouldn't find before in books, maps, astronomical tables, or even the table of content. Because Ong will say, well, the table of content feels natural to us, but what is it? It's not a text that you can read and would make sense, right? It's a text for the mind. It's a higher level of text because it's not a text that makes sense unless you connect it to the process of reading through the entire book. And then you use it as a model of the book. So to them is in itself a visual tool, the table of content. In terms of communication, it should not be forgotten that by the 1500s, the postal systems in Europe are fully developed and there is no change for the next 500 years, pretty much uh, a letter traveling from London to Paris, from Milan to Rome, uh, would take the same amount of days in the year 1510 as in the year 1910, right? Meaning before trucks, automobiles were introduced, pretty much the same amount of time. We, we have records, so we can say that it's about the same amount of time. And of course, I'm mentioning this because the postal network is a communication network in general, and then books travel through the postal network as well. Censorship comes out. Now, of course, anyone would think that the dark ages are the period of censorship and the period when witches are burned at stake. In fact, more people are burned during the 1500s, the modern era, than the Middle Ages, and, and there is systematic persecution of heretics and systematic censorship that didn't exist in the Middle Ages. There was more freedom of expression in the Middle Ages than later on, exactly because now it's easier. Before, anyone could write something in a manuscript and circulate it. Now you have a relatively small number of printing presses to check 
So you can send cops to visit and say, what are you printing? Or have a law where it says, for every book that is being printed by the, your company, you have to give two copies to the local authorities so that we know what you're printing, that it's not uh, something radical, something that will uh, generate social disobedience. Therefore, by the 1550s, the church comes out with the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, the uh, list of the prohibited books, meaning these are books that you cannot read in certain areas of Europe. In other areas, you cannot read and you cannot have them in the house uh, as well. Okay? The church will tell you if you read them, of course, you, your soul will be compromised. Uh, and you have the beginning of the imprimatur. Imprimatur is a Latin verb that means let it be printed. Meaning, if you want to sell a book and if you want to stay in business, not to suffer the consequences of the illegitimate nature of the contents of what you print, you need to submit a copy of the book for approval before you start producing it. And the book will be read by a representative of the local authorities or a representative of the church. And they will have their names. So there will be a short paragraph in the frontispiece matter of the book saying, this book was reviewed by so-and-so and, -so and approved for publication, meaning that the contents are in compliance with religious laws, moral laws, political laws, legal systems. This generates a funny thing, which is the false geography of printing. How do you print a book that is illegal, that has content that is considered revolutionary, illegitimate, uh, anarchic in, in nature? Well. You print it in Venice, but you put on it not your name, the name of your company. You put that it was printed in Switzerland or Belgium or France, and you come up with a fake name of another company. This way, when it comes, when, it, when this book is being sold in a bookstore, if the authorities are elected of the revolutionary contents of this book, who can be persecuted, right? They will not go to Belgium, they will not go to Paris, and there is no, virtually no extradition during this period. So it becomes a, a, a common practice that anything that is cutting edge ideologically is printed with a false place and a false company. Or, as an alternative, since the classics are revered, respected almost as much as the scriptures, as the Bible, then Machiavelli is in the Index Librorum Prohibitorum. Machiavelli is forbidden reading. Then you publish the content attributing, assigning the ideas of Machiavelli to Tacitus, who was a Roman historian uh, that became part of the canon of the classics. So nobody can prevent a Roman historian of this caliber, Tacitus, to be printed if you put Machiavelli's names in those pages, they would say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Machiavelli is the devil, right? Or uh, a disciple of the devil. But Tacitus is easier because uh, Tacitus had spoken about the first emperors and provided uh, an insight into the dark side of, um, of famous corrupt emperors such as Caligula, Nero, etc., or Claudius uh, even. In fact, he embellished their uh, dark side. He, he exaggerated. If we think Nero was um, a, a complete lunatic or uh, associate Caligula just to the fact that he brought a horse to the Senate and made him a senator, is because of people such as Tacitus. So it was easier to talk about the evil side of politics using Tacitus as a real or fake source than Machiavelli. Of course, you have a lot of plagiarism during this period, right? Because there are no copyright laws initially, and then they're established little by little in a variety of countries. There is a lot of clandestine printing, a lot of piracy, right? People reprinting uh, with different names, different titles, the same kind of material. It's easy to steal. The book talks about five kinds of reading, and I'll go through the main thing. And again, don't be lost into the details. 
into the specifics of the example, just try to understand the concept when you read the book about, when you read the, the several pages devoted to the five kinds of reading. Critical reading is easy to understand. You have a lot of books, and now you can compare ideas, because an intellectual from the Middle Ages at best would have a library of two or 300 books. The rest they knew was from their formal education and from what they listened to when they got together, they gathered with other intellectuals. Now you can have a library where different points points and counterpoints on any topic can be found. Then you have this kind of private reading. Uh, and the book is, is, is a bit confused about this, but just keep in mind what I'm telling you. So people who are in a subordinate positions, such as women or people from the lower classes, are doing a kind of private reading that is mostly a form of escapism, a form of entertainment, not, not that books were not read during the Middle Ages with the idea of relaxing or finding some pleasure in stories that were fictional. But during the Middle Ages, the idea is that even when you are reading something that is simply entertaining, some educational value will be found attached to it. In fact, more often than not, there is no pure entertainment. It's always a mix of educational and entertaining material in any kind of books. But what are you reading? You're reading something that is entertaining, but at the same time is both recreating your spirit and also teaching you about human nature, right? Even if it is love poetry, it is still human nature. That's the foundation of the humanities, right? That's why you find the humanities in your SPC outside of buildings, etc. The idea that you read a book, a fictional book, to read and learn about human nature. So it's not just pure entertainment. In here we're talking about Shivaric literature that is completely out of the world. So it's a way to escape from reality. And then you go back to reality with ideas that do not match the social expectations. However, private reading could involve very well even the second most popular, or in some areas, the first most popular kind of literature, lives of saints, books about religious literature. That is also a big chunk of what people read in private, okay? And again, keep in mind that we talk about private reading exactly because reading in public was prevalent in some societies in other areas. Creative reading means people read, but they don't understand. They misunderstand constantly what they read. And we have some egregious example. For example, a famous Italian scholar who's worked also in the US, Carlo Ginsburg, talks about the process, the trial of the Inquisition against this Miller, who had the fanciest ideas. He had a small but very diverse library but the things he, he thought he learned about the, the universe, about history, about society, are similar to uh, the, the various uh, QAnon theories or conspiracy theories that you find in the internet where people, regular people exposed to regular information come up with the most extravagant ideas. And the same happens for this Menocchio, to this particular reader. So, Literacy is limited, education is limited. When you read, when you find and read a book from the past, you're not extracting the same kind of content. Don't assume that a reader from 500 years ago would read the same way and understand the book the same way, okay? And you go from intensive reading, where in the past people had few books and read them multiple times, spent a lot of time, memorized, long passages, and this was true for a long time, to just flipping the pages, browsing the book, skimming through the book, and that's why book organization becomes important. Where do we want to direct your reader? And extensive reading means your reading is not limited to one book and you skip from book to book, sampling expert, uh, excerpts, portions of different books. 
in general, the privatization of reading, the individual access to books creates a different sense of what individual identity is. It changes in different ways. Of course, let's go back to the idea of silent reading, and silent reading meaning means I'm reading for myself, right, first and foremost. And then consumerism gets into the process because I am what I think when I'm reading those books, right, which is not necessarily a good match of what the books are telling, but I am also the books I can buy, right? I am being defined by a product, the book that I buy. Of course, people would borrow books, but keep in mind, for example, that there are no public libraries during the 1500s or 1600s. Public library will come slowly with the, seven, the, the 18th century and then mostly throughout the 19th century. But for the first 200, 250 years, you don't find public places where you have access to books. That's why the book is the first kind of consumerist product that defines your identity the same way that you now go and buy clothes that you think define your public persona, or you buy a technological device, a smartphone that defines your persona, and therefore you're willing to spend more money even to buy something that you can afford because you associate what you are and the image you project with the things you have in public, your smartphone, your automobile, if you have one, or et cetera, et cetera, or the traveling you do and the images of those travels that you can put on Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. This is the beginning because you have one product that becomes conducive to the construction of your identity and the identity that you then express and manifest in society. Those were the main points, and again, keep in mind that we do this in order to understand principles, concepts, not to remember what exactly Marshall McLuhan and Ong will say. The questions in the exam will not be leading that way, rather will be what kind of reading, what happens with the printing revolution, what changes happen in society, and then you, you feel free to add examples, but the main ideas are what is uh, really relevant. Let me do number four first so that I make sure that I go through all the points and then we go back to the discussion of your reactions to Evernote. So you know that you have a digital project uh, to complete by the end of the semester. It is based on one of the apps that are introduced. Two, you've seen already Evernote and uh, Notion. The third one will be introduced on Wednesday next week, which is DocuWiki. So you have to choose one of those. If you have another digital application that is similar, that is still geared towards knowledge handling, knowledge processing, let me know. And I myself, at the end of the semester, will briefly introduce alternatives, Nimbus Notes, Roam, Obsidian, and especially Roam and Obsidian. Uh, Roam is R-O-A-M, uh, are gaining a lot of traction. By the way, Notion just had a few days ago their big annual uh, presentation event where the founder and the CEO uh, of Notion presented about the innovative features added to the product and also uh, uh, mapped uh, the, 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 the path ahead. And it was kind of disappointing. You, you can find it on the internet, you can find uh, the, the, the official recording, or you can find the one with a commentary by Francesco of Keep Productive, which is a popular blog. Some of you took his videos on Evernote. It was kind of disappointing because clearly they're going corporate. They're catering more and more to corporate organization. The big changes they uh, announced there were all about teamwork and how team can teams, large teams can collaborate inside Notion. And clearly there was less attention paid to the individual customers, the individual uh, consumers, their des desiderata, their, their uh, wishes, or, or their complaints, okay? So, digital project, 
in general, regardless of your app. The first point that you have to consider in order to build your plan, your, your project, is that the project in a course such as this about the history of knowledge has to be connected, associated with some goals that are related to knowledge, okay? That's why in terms of content, then there are certain kinds of content that don't work as well, right? So the content that works better is academic in nature, intellectual in nature. Although it, it could be uh, something like a wiki related to a complex game, a complex video game, right? But having a collection of pages about music, music genres, or uh, Taylor Swift would not work, or a series of pages about a sport or sport athletes would not necessarily work because we're talking about information which can be structured in the form of a regular traditional database, but what kind of knowledge are you going to extract, right? So first of all, you have to ask yourself, these two questions are fundamental to the quality of your project. Is my project going to be more than what I could produce with a series of traditional website pages? Traditional pages with HTML, which is the language of the internet together with CSS, JavaScript, etc. Okay, so is there any added value in terms of knowledge to what I am creating? Okay, and think back of the definition of what an epistemic engine is that I provided in the first few weeks of the semester. Second, most important question, does the final project include some kind of a process that is built into the digital project that entails just more, more than just reading? Because if you have a series of web pages where you were able to put on the web information easier than using HTML simply because with Notion you can just write or even with Evernote you can just write. Format is quite easy. And then the user can just open one page and read from it. There is no added value in terms of processing knowledge, storing knowledge in a way that makes accessing knowledge easier than just having to read or finding a word with the find with a search box okay those are the two philosophical principles that you have to ask yourself if you want to have a quality problem as a consequence advanced searching will have to be enabled in your project that is to say your project is built in such a way in terms of the distribution of content the links the tags, the keywords, that you are able to perform operations that involve more than your memory or the grinding through the pages until I find what I'm looking for. And advanced searching means that in one way or the other, depending on the app, I'm able to filter some pages based on content that I'm looking for or produce a cluster of pages that are related in more complex way. And those relationships extend beyond what I would immediately have in my mind. And ideally, if this were about a research project producing new knowledge, ideally, I would enjoy the advantage by using a digital tool of having patterns visible that would not be immediately visible unless I spent hours and hours and read all the material multiple times. Exactly because I've built enough knowledge and advanced features that just by filtering, just by using links, tags, keywords, and Boolean searches, etc., I can pull out of what in your case will be just a few dozen pages. But in the case of a real research project might be thousands of pages, I'm able to pull out just 10 or 12 that will show me a pattern with a stronger kind of evidence compared to any other traditional approach. 
So you understand why, if you start with this in mind, then your choice of content is important. And clearly for you, the easiest kind of content would be notes from this class, notes from another class, notes that you take if you do when you read a book to prepare for a midterm or a final exam, right? That would be the best kind of material because you have knowledge of different levels, because you clearly have a goal, which is how can I learn in a way that is not just memorization? How can I focus on a certain aspect of chemistry or biology through the various notes? Because it's a recurring theme, right? Because there is a pattern, a thematic pattern that I want to bring up because my knowledge, serious, thorough academic knowledge is about connections, right? And therefore, a book, a textbook, or my notes can be linear, but there are multiple connections that exist across various sets of notes, and this digital tool allows me to see the similarities in certain biological, chemical, physical phenomena, etc. So choose the content carefully, and of course, feel free to consult with me once, twice, multiple times until you find a content where I can say, I think that's the right of content. Of course, you have to choose a digital app, but I put there as the third element because the best app is the one that fits the project, right? So once you have a project in mind, then you can say this is better or that is better. And once you have all those things lined up, the next phase of your project is to think of the design, right? And design means multiple things. The whole project, the various pages. For example, once you've gathered content or you start gathering content, how do you distribute content through the pages? Because again, if you have a page with 5,000 words in it, then what are you doing that is advanced and dynamic? You're just putting in front of me 10 pages that I'll have to scroll through when I'm looking for something. Or if I'm looking for something using the search box, I'll find so many hits, so many results within the same page that again, I'll have to scroll and see all of them one after the other. Am I using the style just to make my project nice, look nice? No, the style should be driven by the need to bring some contents to major evidence, right? So uh, you can use highlights, you can use bold, you can use italics, you can use call out boxes, you can use quotes for matching in a certain way. Think of the goal of learning, going through the material and learning for a final exam. What, how would you like to use the style to support your review of the material, right, for example? And then of course you have to be consistent. So every page should have a table of contents ideally, right? If the app allows that. Or every page will follow a certain template with some kind of sections. For example, you might have at the end of each page a navigational map, links that take you to different pages or pages that are connected. And what are the basic elements, as I said before? Is there a summary of the page at the beginning so that you don't have to review everything in order to remember what is in the page, etc., etc. Of course, it's very important that you find E and F included in your project. You'll need tags or keywords or both. By tags, I mean something that usually can be clicked and then everything that is tagged in the same way is clustered together. Keywords can be just textual, but I make sure that I include certain keywords so that when I'm looking with advanced searches for a certain kind of material, I find the right pages. Internal links are essential, right? Like in Wikipedia, the strength of Wikipedia is all in the internal links. That's why the fact that it's not 100% accurate doesn't really matter. And other advanced features, depending on the app should be included as well 
first in my mind is transclusion, where that is possible, both in Notion and DocuWiki, that is possible. Transclusion means that you may have separate pages or separate paragraphs with different kinds of information distributed in an atomic way, meaning that each block is an atom of information. But then you can also put together those various separate blocks in a page that doesn't have any text, but just links, just code that links the material of that page to the other blocks. And whenever the, the content of the blocks is changed, the page with transclusion changes automatically. That is one of the frequent formats and languages of the internet, right? A lot of web pages have transclusion done with JavaScript, with HTML, CSS, CSS, yes. Um, these apps allow you to do that in an easier way. Then, finally, your presentation, really your presentation is this kind of show and tell. You're not doing anything else, anything more than showing me, considering me a potential user, what can be done with this thing? What can be done with your project? Meaning, what is that your project has done that adds value, power, intellectually in terms of knowledge to the content? And you demonstrate that not just showing me page after page, but doing, doing advanced things, such as performing advanced searches, performing filtering or clustering, showing me the transclusion, the, the blocks that were that exist separately, but also dynamically get together in some longer pages. And besides showing and telling, reflect is another important element because of course this is a university, we're, we're involved in intellectual enterprise, therefore at the end of your presentation, some elements of reflection. What do you think are the best features or the shortcomings of this app? What would be in your mind the ideal app? what would you expect to find in the next generation of knowledge-based apps, etc. Okay, so that is also important as an element of the um, presentation. We have two minutes for any questions or comments. Or just to enjoy the silence. And again, this silence is not natural. You think it is natural. This kind of silence never existed up until social media and digital devices. Anyone, uh, my generation and previous generations went to schools where people were chatting a lot more during the lectures. And now, instead, every student who is bored or doesn't want to pay attention to the class will just find refuge in the screen of the computer, the phone, so they'll be silent for that reason. In my high school, people were talking the whole morning during the lectures. There was always someone whispering and talking to, to each other. And now, your, your mindset has been influenced by the introduction of these uh, technology, and the whole environment of the classroom has changed. And of course, not that teachers would not react and, and call on people who were talking, but there was constantly talking for five hours of high school. People would be talking. Of course, I was first row, so I was not a big talker, but I was a different kind of student, and that's why I'm here and tormenting you with my excessive talking. Have a nice weekend. Make sure the attendance comes back to this table.